Hello FPL managers, welcome to a new episode of the FPL Optimized Podcast, this is episode number 88. I'm your host Sartaip and we have a great episode for you today. This is the podcast in which we combine analytics with the good old eye test. Data or grass or data and grass, that's the question. My co-host Bas is on vacation once again and it's a perfect time to bring some analytics guests. Today I have not one, not two, but three guests and we will talk about risk in FPL. It will be a different format than what we usually do. We will cover some key concepts and I will ask questions to the experts in the room. Variance is a topic we talk often and risk is often seen as something like analytics oriented players are ignoring. One of the common criticism is the inclusion of players like Ederson who has high EV but very low ownership and picking him against cheaper goalkeepers who have really high ownership rates. This indeed exposes our teams to big swings, but let's leave that discussion for later. To start, I will ask my guests to introduce themselves. Let's start with James, also known as FF underscore Trout on Twitter, who was a guest before, but let's hear again for people tuning in for the first time. James? Hi, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pleasure to be here again. Um, I'm very excited to talk about risk in FPL. who am I? Uh, I am, yeah, Trout. There's not much else to say. I've never had any top 10K finishes or anything like that. Um, uh, I've got no interesting uh, qualifications or anything like that. I just really like FPL and I like uh, modeling FPL. So that that's me. Yeah. <laughs> what an undersell. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually warned you not to be modest, but okay. Uh, and James's current rank is 1,018. He's just outside of 1K. Um, but thank you. And next, Johnny, also known as FPL underscore Spaceman. Johnny is a regular guest in our pod, but again, could you introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Johnny, or JC, um, FPL Spaceman on Twitter. Um, you might remember me from such diagrams as the Venn diagram that depicts all the fixtures. Um, and I was the massive data champion on FPL Review last season. Uh, I'm in the top 1K. I'm the highest ranked of the four of us, so must be playing better than everyone else. <laughs> um, I feel for the overly uh, boastful rather than the, the modest. Um, no, again, just very similar to James. Really interested in FPL. Love going into analytical findings within it. And um, yeah, excited to talk about our topics today. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, Sigurd Eskenant, also known as FPL President. Yes, hello, happy to be here. Um, I guess the reason why I'm here is because of my poker background. I'm a former professional poker player. And also I was the president of the Norwegian Poker Federation, which is how I got my FPL name. I thought that was a, <laughs> a good thing to use. And also very happy Happy and fond of FPL. And I think I was third MD rank last year, actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I was at least, at least very high up there. So, but th- this uh, this season I'm 2.8K or 2.7K overall, I, I believe, uh, so far. So, hoping to make this my best season ever because I have never finished within the top 10K before. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, we know you're a great player, but I'm surprised that you don't have a tank I'm, definition. I'm great in theory, but uh, not on grass. <laughs> Big difference. Oh, we all. Yeah, it, it eventually comes. Um, again, thank you again for joining me today. Um, so we will have several parts uh, in today's episode. And in part one, we will talk about how we can measure risk. And I will introduce the basic concepts before our deep dive with my guests today. And an analogy will make it easy. So here we go. So suppose you are leaving your home for the commute and there is not a single cloud around that could ruin your day. Next thing you know, you'll find yourself sprinting for cover when a shower hits out of nowhere. So this is the daily dance with the risk we all know too well. It's the possibility that an action or event leading into an undesirable outcome. Um, Risk at its heart is about embracing uncertainty. So that's the other key concept. Uncertainty is the key piece of every decision we make in FBL too. For example, player performances can defile all predictions, injuries can come out of nowhere, and the popularity of the players among managers can fluctuate like the stock market. So each of these variables adds zest to the game and challenges us to chart a new course through an ever-shifting landscape. 
In FPL, just like your weather forecast in the morning, there is uncertainty about possible outcomes. But how can we measure this uncertainty? And here comes the concept of probability. It's like estimating the chance of rain based on cloud patterns. And in FPL, probability helps us to gauge the likelihood of a player scoring, maybe getting a hole, having a price change, or getting injured, and you know similar concepts. Then there is the expected value, which is what you will typically predict to happen on average, like expecting a certain amount of rain over a month. For FPL managers, again, expected value could mean the average points a player is projected to score over the next few games based on historical and current data. Variance is all about the spread of these predictions and the range of what could happen. It is what tells us that even if we expect no rain, we could end up with a downpour or a dry spell. In FPL terms, it represents the unpredictability of a player's performance week to week. And if you can measure the risk, you can manage it. So that's the key uh, idea here. You can identify potential problems in your teams, minimize their impact if you want to, and increase the chance of winning your mini league, for example. Risk appetite is what defines our gameplay. Uh, it's usually this thing. We have people with maverick chip strategies, uh, like Andy Martin, uh, like going for players with risk minutes, maybe, and also teams with full of differentials just to catch um, the higher rank tiers. At the other end of the spectrum, a way to reduce the risk is what we call diversification, where you don't rely on particular teams too much, and you spread your picks around different uh, Premier League teams. And finally, return on investment is the comparison of points you get from an FPL player against their cost. It could be either the price or the EV sacrifice uh, for getting that player. Okay, with this, oh, it was a long one. With this, let me ask James about how we define risk in FPL. And I'm asking because James was working on a variance model for FPL challenge game. And I wonder what kind of variance there is in FPL. Yeah, thanks for that, Sertel. Very, very nice analogy. Um, yeah, I, I've done a lot of work over the last few weeks. And I mean, I've been thinking about this kind of stuff for years, but FPL Challenge has really given me uh, an opportunity to get my teeth sunk into it. And I'm very excited to chat about what uh, what I've been up to. Um, and guys, by the way, I've got a few slides and I'll be talking for a while. So please interrupt me if you have any uh, thoughts or questions. Um, so yeah, to start with your question, how do we quantify what risk actually is in FPL? I think that risk, I think I, I think that risk in FPL is is very misunderstood. Um, I think it's often overcomplicated, and I don't know. I think that most FPL players view risk in terms of single decisions, and oh yeah, this is a risky decision. This is not a risky decision. But to me. The concept is actually, um, I guess, a lot fuzzier, um, especially over the season-long FPL game. So to me, the right way to think about risk in FPL is to think about a kind of a shape or a curve of possible outcomes across the whole season. Um, so we have the best outcomes that could possibly happen to us on the right and the worst outcomes that can happen to us on the left. And when we're actually engaging with risk, what we're doing is we're manipulating the width of this curve. A more risky strategy widens the set of outcomes um, in the long term, and a less risky strategy narrows a set of, uh, a set of outcomes um, in the long term. So what actually is the width, I suppose, is the next question. And there's a, there's a couple of ways to go about measuring it. Um, we can talk about absolute width, uh, sorry, absolute risk, which is the, uh, I guess, the deviation that you expect in the amount of points that your team scores. Or we can go on thinking about relative risk, which is the, the deviation that you can expect in your rank. And to me, relative risk is, is much more interesting. Um, so on the video, you have a, a kind of a formula here. Um, and if you're listening, with your with your headphones, then you uh, you know, lucky out. you. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think that will take that will take the, most of the episode runtime. So uh, <laughs> let's not bother. Um, but no, no, it, it's it's a kind of a horrifically complicated thing. But um, essentially, th th this is a formula for 
relative variance. And the way to think about relative variance and the, the risk of your whole team is, in a way, you own every single asset in the game, but ones that you don't own, you own with a negative weight. And the, that negative weight is proportional to how many people around you own them. So in, in some sense, if everybody else in the game owns a player and you don't own them, then you own them negatively. And that, that's, I guess, in my opinion, the best way to think about risk, it, to, to think about how we calculate and quantify risk in FPL. Um, so how then do we actually integrate this into our... Um, into our FPL process is the next question. And uh, we can do this in the same way that we quantif- that, that, that we put EV in our process. We can actually um, take this expression and put it in an FPL solver. And then in the solver, we have an EV expression and a variance expression. And you can weight these in different ways, um, depending on how safe or how risky you want to play the game. Um, and yeah, then we come on to specifically my modeling in FPL Challenge. Um, so in FPL Challenge, um, every possible solution has a kind of a known measurable EV and variance, right? So we can, there's a certain amount of points that you expect the team to score. And based on that formula from before, we can guess how much variance is contained within a team. And um, we can plot the EV and variance of every feasible setup possible on a pair of axes, which is uh, what this plot is. This plot is actually the outline of that feasible region shape. So th- this this plot is is absolutely full of uh, of every possible team. And I suppose the ones that we're interested in are towards the top right hand side of this plot where teams will have higher EV and higher standard deviation. So this is not necessarily true for the season long game, because you might also be interested in the top left hand side of this shape um, in, in, in there. But in, in FPL challenge, I think almost everybody wants to play it in a, in a very risky way. Um, so then the next question is, how do we actually, you know, how, how do we actually calculate the the value that we that, that we have right how, how do we um how do we value um a certain amount of risk weight um along with a certain amount of variance and well fpl challenge has a pretty concrete value stru- value function that you can use which is that basically you want to win the game <laughs> and using the uh the variance um the variance expression uh, and the the EV expressions, we can kind of guess, um, I don't know, distributions for how our team's going to do. Mm -hmm. And then based on expected ownership numbers, we can basically make guesses about the, I suppose, the distribution of distributions of outcomes in the crowd. And using um, using these distributions, we can actually model a probability of any team lying somewhere in this region winning the game in a certain game week. And this is plotted. This is what's plotted on this graph. And you can see the further to the top right you go, according to this model, the more likely you are to actually win the game. Um, And yeah, if we keep going through the slides, Mm -hmm. we can kind of see what this feasible region looks like in practical terms. So in the middle, you have just a whole bunch of kind of junk teams. So there's this (laughs) team, there's this team right from the very, very center. I just tried to find a team right in the center of the, um, of the feasible region. And it's, you know, it's got all of these really bizarre picks, some quite good picks. Like it's, you know, it's got like Foden, Havertz, Gabrielle, Edison, Ruben Diaz, all of these players, um, but it's also got a couple of a couple of rubbish picks, and this is this is just what the whole distribution is is full of. Um, the real interesting solutions are the one on the fringes of this shape. Those are the ones that are interesting to examine and that we can get insights from. So if you can go to the next slide, mm-hmm. here um, this is the team on the the right hand side of this shape. So for reference, this has five Brentford defenders and five 
five Bournemouth strikers or five <laughs> Bournemouth midfielders and forwards. And then it has Alfie Doughty against Man City for good reference. <laughs> you know, just um, just just because why not? You need an extra player in there. Um, and this team is the most risky configuration that you can possibly get to. It has a uh, rugby on captain. And um, so this team, you actually have a decent chance of winning the game. If you, if you, you know, not obviously it's never, you're never going to have that higher chance of winning FBL challenge with any team, but this team is probably a bit better than any team that you would get to if you weren't factoring in the risk of a team at all, mm-hmm. which is perhaps an interesting insight. Um, and then we can go on to the next team. This team here is the very worst team that you can get to if your if your aim is to win FPL Challenge. So we've got actually some good assets in here, and this is surprising. We've got we've got Harland, um, we've got Foden, and we've got Son. And that that initially comes across as a bit surprising because surely if you want to lose, um, you should just pick players who aren't going to do very well. But first of all, one caveat I will make here is that I filtered out any players with fewer than forty five minutes expected. So these are all going to be players who are going to get some points. Um, but the reason why these players crop up is because if these players do well, then everyone's going to do well. So it's kind of um, it, it kind of doesn't help you having these players. Um, and the rest of the players in this team, we've got like you know Mpanzu, uh, Clark, both from Luton against Man City. These players are pretty rubbish, right? They're they're never realistically going to carry you to a to a winning performance. Um, and then finally. On the next slide, this is the 11 that this week my model says has the best chance of winning at the moment. So what we're seeing here is five times City defence. So a kind of a 4-4-2 with four City defenders and Edison in goal. Um, and then we've got Odegaard, Saka, Mbumo, Son, Solanke, um, Tony. And my model suggests that possibly the best captain this week is... Um, is Tony. Um, and yeah, on, on to the next slide, we've got the team that I might actually be going with for this week, because obviously my model, it, it's still, I mean, there, there's some good stuff with it, right? But it's actually still in a fairly primitive stage with relation to um, to the, the game itself, because we've got all of these strategies, like putting a vice captain on a player who plays early and filling up your bench with, with, with players who play early. And the way that I'm resolving these kind of things at the moment is kind of a semi-automatic process where I'm running the same model, but with different constraints to put certain players on benches and then letting the model pick the rest of the teams. So this team has, it has um, Tony captain, or Tony vice captain rather, because he plays before first. Um, on the bench, we've got double Man City defense or triple Man City defense rather, and Son. Um, and then we've got quadruple Liverpool defense in the team. And the other spots are Luis Diaz, Odegaard, Saka, Mbumo, Solanke, and Muniz. So it's kind of an interesting insight that actually the teams that I think are likeliest to uh, to let you win the game aren't just teams full of players that nobody owns. There's a bit of a balance to be struck, right, between sol- between owning assets that are probably going to return good points and owning assets that very few people own. Um, The other thing to mention is that as part of this solver, um, correlation between assets is also modeled. So this is why we have all of these quadruple defenses. It's generally owning assets with correlated outcomes increases your exposure to risk, as Sir Talp said already. Um, So if you want a team that is likely to win in a certain week, then you want loads and loads of players from the same team. And um, yeah, I, I think that's that's about all, I'll, all all I have. I mean, there's some other insights here. Like I could kind of say from my model that in general it's worth giving up about one EV to get four or five points in standard deviation. That's kind of where the grey area is. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's it's just not usually best to go with kind of really, really obscure players who nobody else is going to pick. It's good to stick with kind of maybe 10 to 20% owned players who are who are going to do quite well. While we're here, um, I just need to mention that for the FPL challenge stuff this week, 
I've completely neglected to include anything to do with the challenge itself of um, red cards and yellow cards because it's so I, I like did it for about ten minutes and it's so boring and I, I just <laughs> I, I just gave up and just decided to ignore it completely. So Not take all of these. Challenge. No, no, um, too challenging. Yeah. So take take everything that I all of these specific results. I think with a grain of salt. Mm-hmm. If if Tony gets a red card, I'll blame you. <laughs> that's, that's my my takeaway. And my follow up question on this immediately. Um, but we will talk about applying and taking this in other parts. But this is for a single game week, obviously. And in FPL, we try to maximize the EV. Usually, like we don't think about too much uh, too much about the variance. But if you were if you had this graph, like roughly for every game week. And suppose you're stuck with the same team. Would you go with, the, again, the top EV or would you sacrifice a little bit EV to increase your standard deviation a bit? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, and risk in the season long game is so much harder to quantify because you've got all of these different decision points where you have slightly more information each time, but you also have less time to, I guess, change your season long risk profile. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just really, really hard to quantify. I think if your aim across the whole season, right, is to win win the season long game, then it's probably worth undertaking as much risk as possible because you want mm-hmm. to give yourself as much of a chance to get l- lucky and kind of win the lottery. But if your if your aim is to finish in the top ten k or the top one k, then I don't think we have a great answer for that at the moment. And that's I don't know. It's something that I definitely want to want to try thinking about in the future. I mean, in general, my strategy in FPL is to try and pick a team that's not too risky and not too not risky. I maybe lean slightly towards risk for most of the season. Mm -hmm. And then once we're in the kind of the business end of the season on the home straight, I think I like to um, I like to then look at risk in slightly more detail because right at the end of the season is when you can best measure how your risk is, is, is going to interact with your outcomes before right at the start of the season, it, it's a really difficult thing to do. Yeah, yeah, certainly. The other thing I'd add on the sort of season long data compared to like a single game week solve is that for a single game week, we know the effective ownerships of all the players. I mean, mm-hmm. five minutes before deadline, like that's going to be accurate. It's not going to change too much. So in the same way that James was talking about how you you think about owning all these players and the ones that you don't have in your team, you own in a negative sense. And that affects the shape of your distribution. Not only are you making one change a week plus chips or whatever to the way that you can affect your shape, but the shape of your distribution will be affected by external factors such as what other people are doing. So if lots of people are piling in on a player that you can't reach, your distribution shape is going to change in a way that you can't affect. So not only can you not affect it because it's not your action, but you don't know that it's going to be affected that way three game weeks out because suddenly this player's got injured. So there's uncertainty around the metrics that we're trying to put in here as well. Whereas in a single game week, obviously maybe we're less certain about the players who are playing on Sunday compared to Saturday, um, because that might be a hurricane, who knows. Um, We don't have as much information, but generally over a weekend, we can be pretty sure we know what's, we have as much available data as possible. Whereas over the season, things change and we're trying to factor that in and we have to measure try and measure that uncertainty about what might happen and how things might change which is where we do the things with like perturbating the ev for adding noise um but also i think you can try and estimate what we think the effect of ownership might be in a few game weeks time Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you know who do we think people are going to captain it's a little easier to guess who do we think people might own? Because we can see the transfers this week and the effect of ownership this week. But we don't know who's going to be captained in double game week 37 now. Yeah. Because it depends things on change. The performance. So that's going to affect our risk profile quite a lot. Sure. I think the, the way I think about this shape, circle, whatever we want to call it. Um, oh, blob. <laughs> the blob, <laughs> blob, yes. And do, do correct me if I'm wrong here, is that essentially the if we think about our risk profile, our sort of distribution of, of outcomes. Um, we want to maximize the right-hand side of our... Dist- we want to be... The chance of getting lots of points, we want to increase that, to increase our chance of winning. So 
moving the whole distribution to the right a bit is increasing the expected value overall. So that's the y-axis. And the x-axis is stretching or widening the distribution. So in order to maximize your edge on the far right of chance of getting lots more points, which would be enough to win, we need a combination of stretching that distribution, widening it, and shifting it all to the right, which is why just shifting it to the right but having a really shallow tail is not enough to win, even though it's enough to do quite well and your tail on the other end is lower. So that's where this idea of trying to be trying to get those correlations as well, that will widen the distribution because clean sheets all come in together. So defenders and goalkeepers have a really high correlation. Um, so if you have four defensive assets with 50% clean sheet rate, they're all from the same team, you get four or none. So half of the time you're getting four clean sheets. If you have four separate teams, all with a 50% clean sheet rate, the chance of you getting all of them is 0.5 to the power of four. So it's you know, you're more likely to get two or one or three because yeah. you've got that narrowed distribution, but you're not maximizing your chances of getting four. If you don't get four, you're probably going to lose. So you might as well go for four or bust. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why a lot of the teams that have done quite well, I think, have been loading on one defense, yeah. yeah, particularly. Yeah, on that note, I should also mention that, uh, like, if the field is pretty bad, like, suppose everyone is playing FPL really bad, then like maximizing EV might be enough to win it. But if everyone is doing pretty well, then you might want to take even more risk. Because like if we know how many points the number one will get, then you know you can maybe estimate you know how much variance you need to have, I think. But yeah, we will talk about decision making later. But uh, I want to ask President Sigurd about how risk is measured in poker and if he sees any similarities and differences to FPL. I mean there's a couple of different ways to look at it. One very obvious and important way to look at risk uh, in poker is, is what we call bankroll management, right? So so in poker our money is is a tool and we we need it to we need our bankroll to be able to play tournaments or cash game or whatever we play. And if you play too high, if you play too high buy in tournaments or too high buy in cash games, no matter how good you are, you're on the risk of going broke. And when you go broke then you don't you, you can't play anymore so that's a very obvious way to look at risk and and what, what's called bankroll management um and uh so many great players have um quit poker because of not being able to handle that part of the game <coughs> and there's also other ways of looking at risk in poker especially at tournaments which is more relevant to fpl i think because when you look at the tournament, um, I hope most people are familiar with the concept, but basically you buy into a tournament, you get a certain amount of chips, and then the winner has all the chips at the end, and you get knocked out at some point if, if, you, if you run out of chips. So anyway, to win a tournament, especially like a big field tournament, you have to, you have to get lucky. It's mm-hmm. the same. It's very similar to FPL in the sense that it's a combination of uh, skill and and luck, um, and and you have to play well, but you also have to get lucky. And um, in order to win like a big field tournament, you have to get really lucky. And that's mm-hmm. where I think there's a big similarity to what you just spoke about about taking higher risks because um, there are ways to to increase your variance in in tournaments and to play um, less optimally if you're goal is only to win but in the long run it's not the it's not the correct play and it's not like the it's not the way to maximize your winnings over lifetime but it is the way it is a way to maximize your chance of winning that particular tournament if that makes sense yeah so i think, I think that's the most uh, relevant sort of parallel to poker but i think poker no sorry to fpl but i think poker and fpl are, have many similarities in the way you should approach them. Uh, both are games where you make decision based on based on um, you know information that isn't uh, complete. You know, yeah. so and, mm-hmm. and and try to make as as good uh, decisions as you possibly can with what you have. Okay, I have a question, Sigurd. Um, so in in poker, um, as far as I know, I, I'm not 
really an expert. Um, I know that you have tournament, you have tournament games, and you have cash games. Yes. Which which of these do you think FPL is more like? Uh, I think tournament, uh, definitely. Like, uh, so cash game, you can look at like life is like kind of a lifelong thing. You know, you it sort of never ends. You can you can you can buy into it and you can play for an amount of hours and you cash out your chips and you can come back the next day and it goes um, and and it's pretty much like in cash game what you want to do is you only care about making um, the best EV decisions you can and not play too high because if you play too high then you might run out of action and um, I guess like if you look at your like for instance, when I look at FPL players and who's the greatest FPL player, I look at I care much more about you know their history, like their long term history, you know, have and also like the MD thing, and and I guess you can compare that to cash game, you know. But in tournament, tournaments are different in a way that there's many different, um, um, many different um, parts of the tournament, you know. They're, your stack will be will be big at the beginning, and it will get get smaller. And there's the money bubble, like when you get close to the money, that changes your strategy. So many areas in a tournament changes your strategy, and I think that's similar to FPL because it's different parts of the tournament. You have chips, you have double game weeks, you have blanks, and all this kind. You have to adapt all the time, and the landscape changes. And the same it is in tournament, the landscape changes. But in a cash game, you could always refill your your you know funds. You can start out with two thousand dollars and. If you go bust, you just add another two thousand dollars if you have it, of course, and you can play with the same sort of um, with, with, the, with the with the same, I guess, situation over and over. And and in and in a tournament, you can't. So I think that's more relevant to FPL. Okay. Um, thank you. And we have talked about measuring the risk. And in the second part, let's talk more about applying into our decision making. Uh, and let's start with Johnny. This time, uh, how does risk affect your decision making in FBL? I mean, I know that you have been the MD champion, but do you, for example, take effective ownership into account when you are making a decision if you feel like the ownership rate will be really high for a player where the EV is almost equal? And should we take ownership into account when making decisions? I think this is something I've certainly played with a lot more this year. Um, having had that season last year that I think I possibly might not be able to beat in terms of overall quality of play with some fortune in there as well, of course, with things falling my way with doubles and injuries and whatever. Um, but I guess I feel like I'm willing to engage more in that risk and maybe even not quite pay for the risk, but like I, I might as well go for that really high finish because I've now had a quite a high one already. Whereas last season, I think it was much more of a, I'd say risk agnostic is what some people try to call it as in terms of it's just pure EV maximization and robust strategies for making sure that you can still grab that when certain things happen and actually not being too greedy here and there. Um, and the thing that affected me most with effective ownership last year was more to do with captaincy. Um, and actually, the, people would often discuss between two quite close captains in the markets and the projection models and if they were really close but we thought that the slightly lower projected one was the one that was going to be more captained mm -hmm. um so i remember for example bruno fernandez and marcus rashford in a double game week were both pretty close but the models were very slightly favoring bruno um and i went for bruno fernandez because i was happy to take i think this is this is the term free risk that people might have heard <laughs> of before is that actually for a slight EV gain, or even if I think that they're completely level, no EV gain or no EV loss, I can get some relative risk for free. So I captain a slightly less owned player than the one that's been captained by most people, and I'm not paying any expected value in order to do that. So if you want the risk, it's there, it's free, you can take it. That doesn't mean you should, or it's good. That's not always what's true. I think we sort of fetishize free risk in some ways and actually that's kind of a thing that we egg each other on with and plenty of analytical people captain rashford and that was as good a decision depending on what you wanted um but i think that's 
captaincy was the freest risk I could think of in terms of it has no effect on what you do in the following game week. Your team hasn't changed. You've not sold a player. It's not going to affect you down the line. If you get it wrong, you move on. It's as if you pick the other player. You're just down on points. So captaincy was the place where effective ownership had the most impact for me because I guess it's captaincy is sort of like this single game week optimization we're talking about in that you're making a decision for one week that's then done. Whereas making a transfer or a chip plan is something that has these ripple on effects. So that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. And that's where I think this season I've tried a little bit to kind of see which route might lead me to a slightly lower effective ownership set of players. But again, that's hard to estimate because things happen and suddenly people jump on the player that you owned or people jump off him or there's a player that's easy to get to for everyone else and actually suddenly he should be in your team or his EV changes. So I think dead ending into game week 35 for my wild card, I saw two very similar lines, one of which went without Salah in um, game week 31, 32, whenever he played Sheffield United at home. And I thought, actually, that's a short enough time frame that I'm willing to bet a bit of uncertainty on the EV and going without Salah and going for Darwin. Because if it goes wrong, I wildcard in a few game weeks anyway. So I'm not making that risk right at the start. So this is where we talk about the changing landscape and actually right at the end of the season. And if I wildcard in 35, then there's only four game weeks worth of horizon for me to maybe... Um, there's a few lines that are potentially going without Haaland on that wild card, you could even get quite close in EV with if you believe in Joe Pedro's minutes, which um, <laughs> maybe we don't, maybe we do. But um, it's, I mean, I, we'll see how it looks in two weeks. I'm just sort of exploring. But for example, that's not as scary for some people as it was wild carding in game week eight without Haaland because that's so early in the season. There's so much ripple effect going on. You don't know exactly how you're going to get him back, you don't know when you're going to need him back. Turned out he got injured and we didn't need him back as soon as we needed. Some people fell foul of that and swapped at the wrong time. Um, which is why actually at that point in time, I made the decision to swap Haaland to Salah with my free transfers mm. and have the wild card in pocket. So I kind of reduced my... I, I'll almost try and reduce my absolute risk, my inherent risk. So you want a robust line. You can take risk in risky strategies in terms of Let's say you pick Jao Pedro on wildcard 35 and you don't know whether his minutes are going to go up or down. If that goes wrong, you've got to sell him and you miss out on the transfer somewhere else. So actually that's risky in the individual sense. Whereas relative risk is the one that you can kind of try and go for. You can go for quite safe picks that are low owned and have quite a robust line that is going against the effective ownership. So actually that's safe in the picks that you've taken but not in the relative thing but the thing with, with that is is that player prices go up and down based on who's bringing them in and out so actually even then if especially if you do it right at the start of the season if you have some really solid guys and everyone's like oh i he's not scored in a while even though he's a good pick like 90 minutes on penalties we've got to sell him he's not in form and everyone hops off him you can lose team value and that has effect later on so I think it has been something I've been playing with rather than I feel I've got a real grasp of. But I felt freer to play with it this season because, well, for one, I ended up quite high up after game week, sort of 25, 26-ish. And I thought, actually, there's there's a non-zero chance that I could win from here. I think mm -hmm. probably from where I am now, it's probably too far to, to dream that big. But I thought, actually, you know, why not go for that? That's sort of what we want. And that's what we talk about in other tournaments when you're you're close up or or that money bubble that um uh Sigurd was talking about was actually you know I'm top one K with ten game weeks to go. I could and I've got free hit wild card bench boost left. Um maybe, maybe from here, but it's not quite panned out as I wanted. So I think yeah, re relative risk is the the one that's the easiest to play with. Um and possibly the safest to play with, if that makes any sense. Um, because you can have you make you make a transfer for someone risky and it goes wrong, you lose team value, you miss out on some team value on someone that you possibly should have got. You use the transfer on someone that you've then got transfer out, and actually three game weeks down the line, you've lost a lot of expected uh, um, expected value. 
So I think that's kind of how we can try and use that framework to think about it. But I think when when we saw some of the advancements in the analytics space and some of the tools that we're using coming out and feeling like EV maximization is maybe a problem that's not solved, but we're getting quite close to having some pretty high-end stuff, is actually there's this whole other aspect to the game of, like you said, your chance of winning in a really poor field by playing high EV is actually might be sufficient. But as more players get better, we're going to have to start to look for that risk edge rather than a pure expected value edge. And I think that's that's a really exciting time to sort of be in this space. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, so I want to ask Trad a question this time. Uh, well, we kind of talked about applying, uh, you know, risk in a season-long game. But I have this observation, actually. So uh, the field is usually very, very scared of ownership. Or I should say the engaged people on Twitter. Like, if they see that, oh, this player is being like bought by everyone, like, I should also get the same guy. And if they, like, sometimes you have this massive fear of missing out, like, oh, everyone is buying this player. An analytics player, on the other hand, so there are two camps. The first camp is just like, oh, I'm going to maximize EV. That's all I'm going to do. You know, I won't care about ownership. And the second group is, surprisingly, the other way around. They say, oh, like, I will play risky. I will take risk any day, like, as long as it's free or close to being free. So I also see this tendency in you, James. Sometimes you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to go with this guy because, like, he's not owned that much. So... Is that true? Like, that's, do you do you also crave for yeah, risk? Yeah, I feel like that's almost um, libelous to say, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah, I'm definitely. I don't identify with either of the two groups you mentioned. I'm definitely. I like to think some other third thing. I think the effect of ownership is really, really important, um, and it should absolutely direct our strategy. Um, but it should not necessarily direct our strategy in the direction of let's just go with the guys who other people are going with. It's really much more nuanced. And I think it it completely depends on what your value function is. Yeah. And what what I mean by that is how how much how how much happiness you derive from finishing in certain places. So if 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 your only aim is to um in terms of rank is to um finish at the right at the top then it makes a lot of sense to be really really contrarian and to be honest that's probably especially maybe not this season but in the last few seasons that's kind of how I've tried to go about the game is to really cut against the field whenever mm-hmm. I have the chance and play in a way that I suspect might be maximizing my probability of winning the whole game which obviously hasn't gone very well but but anyway um and then if your value function is to finish in the top 20k if that's all that you care about then um then it's probably worth as long as you're fairly good at getting you know a team with good ev it's probably worth you know selling some of that ev to take less risk and to go with the crowd um, but there, but there are frameworks that we can put in place essentially to to measure this kind of stuff. Um, the, yeah, I, th- this season's been an interesting one because I think I started taking a lot of risks. Um, like me and you both set up. We we, we mm-hmm. sold Sal- we we sold Harland um, in Wildcard Eight. Mm-hmm. which I, most people didn't do quite a lot of people did but most people didn't and i i wanted to go there because it gave me such an incredible amount of risk and volatility and i knew the right hand side of my distribution was a very long way away from the center and mm-hmm. there's all of these really incredible outcomes and for once i i did actually get a pretty incredible outcome <laughs> and about you know after the dust had i guess settled on the first wild card, I found myself in and around the top 1000 in the world, which is where I still am. And I'm still there because ever since I found myself in that position, um, I just decided, okay, that's good enough. I kind of want to try and stick here for as long as possible. And that's how I've been playing the game for the last 10 game weeks or so. I've been trying to really aggressively minimize my risk 
um, even at the cost of some EV here or there. Um, and it's kind of an interesting, I'm realizing as we're talking that actually the risk engagement isn't just one thing that you think about for a season and then you have another risk engagement strategy the next season. It seems to almost cut across seasons. Mm-hmm. So Johnny was saying about how he has a different value function this season because of his outcomes last season. And actually I've realized that I'm exactly the same, that my lack of success in terms of outcomes in the past has really contributed towards my um, my wish to, uh, to, to really minimize the amount of risk that I'm undertaking. So I don't know. Yeah, th- there's lots to think about. It's, it's really interesting. And all of this stuff is so fuzzy. Like, none, no one has a clean cut objective. No one really just cares about winning. No one really just cares about getting in the top 10K or whatever. Um, everyone has a different has a different value function and every different value function interacts with effective ownership and risk risk engagement in a mm-hmm. slightly different way and i just think that's really interesting it's a really interesting problem yeah i, I when, whenever i talk to james about this sort of with slightly <laughs> divergent strategies from similar places is I, I do feel a bit naive in that i sort of maybe i just got lucky last season and i'm getting lucky again and maybe i'm doing silly things but i think that's that's why we're playing and that's fun and it's also being aware of that potential downside. If you're aware that that might happen by taking the risk, then that's fine. I think people find unhappiness when they take a risk and it goes wrong and they weren't prepared for it rather than so they weren't expecting it to happen. And actually they were unaware of what their risk engagement actually was rather than them picking a risk engagement that didn't really fit. But are you I saying that we... not everyone is a robot? Not everyone. <laughs> no, no, only some Weird. of us. Some um, but I wonder if we could sort of see it as I know Sigurd was talking about a bankroll in poker. Is do you think I pass this to Sigurd? Do you think there's an emotional bankroll in certain games? Some people do people stop about playing. I, I, I do. I it's do actually. I, I thought about that. Uh, it's maybe a little bit of a stretch, but I do think it is, and I do think it's something you should be conscious about. I think we'll come back to it also, like more the. Uh, I don't know if I want to do it now or later, so forth. But uh, mm-hmm. but oh, yeah. sorry, have I gone off script? No, no, no. no, no but uh, <laughs> no, we can we can talk. But I mean, we can talk. Uh, so so the emotional and mental aspects of of FPL is something that interests me, and it's and and also because it's it's something that I was very interested in in poker for several, for, for different reasons. Um, in poker, of course, we talk about tilt, which is um, which is an emotional response to variance or to it's it's actually an emotional response to either doing really well or doing really poorly uh, or, or being lucky or unlucky, and to play to alter your play strategy based on that response. So, for instance, um, we call it we talk about positive tilt and negative tilt. So. The, the, the classic one is negative tilt. You get unlucky, and then you maybe start taking more risks or play play worse in order to compensate, and then it goes worse. But but there's also a less less known aspect of it. The positive tilt is you get really lucky, and then you start feeling invincible. So you start making decisions because now you feel you feel that you know you can feel the game and you know what's going to happen, etc. And and and. Um, and, and that's that's a different part. And and, and for FPL especially, I, I I see so many people get frustrated and angry and sad because of outcomes. And this is of course also very common in poker. And um, and I think it's something you sh- if you have a tendency to to feel like that, I think you should really think about what kind of risks you take, because the game should be about enjoyment if you don't enjoy it if, if you have too much emotional pain from playing then then you're sort of by taking these risks and having these bad outcomes because of it then you actually might end up i mean some people quit the game because of it right and mm-hmm. um, and there are different ways to look at it. you can also work on that part of, of of yourself like i had to do that in poker i i was struggling with with negative emotions after a longer period of, of running bad so i actually hired a mental coach to work on that for me uh, which was very helpful for me and that also that has also helped me in fpl because now i i mean i have i have 
I'm not a robot, but but I focus very much about uh, decisions and not so much about outcomes, which I think is the healthier way of playing. And as long as I'm happy, really happy and content with my decision, I sort of mostly let that go no matter what happens, which I think, but it's not, it's easier said than done, I think. But but I do think it's a quite big aspect of of this kind of games that has so much variance in variance in them. Yeah, and great discussion so far, by the way. So we were, uh, well, we kind of like started talking about the side effect of risk. That was the third part. And, yeah. you know, taking risk is, thanks for mentioning the psychological elements of risk taking. Do you have a question, Jay? Yeah, I just think it's really, really interesting. The idea of, uh, I wonder when we'll, fi- when, 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 we'll, when, we'll, when we'll see our first professional um, mental coach for fpl like that's <laughs> got to be a gap maybe I maybe mean, johnny maybe could that that's a potential career path for you i thought you were just saying i had positive tilt with your arrow point exactly there. well <laughs> i think that's so the perfect I'll, I'll coach you know. a team of naive invincible idiots and we'll one of us will win and you'll no, all, I, yeah you'll I, all get top 1k finishes perfect i, I mean I, there are really excellent m- mindset coaches that that work across different kinds of sports like poker and golf and that you can use, of course, but of course, it costs money. So in poker, it's really important. That part is extremely important, of course, and because poker is a game of money and it's worth putting some you know, funds into that aspect. But in FPL, I mean, there's... I, you, you'd have to have reasonably well, you know, financial status to, to put like, you know big part of your, you know, I mean, put a thousand dollars or something into that, right? Which is what it might cost you to really work on something like that. So, yeah, I think we we do mock, but also it is is an important element of this game. It's just that this game is, for most, it is just a silly sort of hobby. And it's it's our expression of enjoying football and sort of decision making. And actually, you know, it's got a lot of these tendencies that we have in something like poker or um, sports gambling or any other thing like that or you know I, I think um, sports psychologists work with a lot of professional athletes and actually that's a very different space so it is something we should be aware of and we shouldn't sort of degrade it too much but it, yes it is an amusing thought to kind of bring into this this silly game we play that you have a <laughs> professional coach but I mean we're not I mean I, I do, th- th- I, I do think thing. it's relevant if this is your for many people I think this is your a lot of people's main hobby. It is my main hobby at the moment, or just fantasy uh, games in general. And if there's something that causes you not to enjoy the thing that you, you know, you want to, that you normally enjoy the most, then maybe that's something you need to or you should look into, right? That's that's what I think anyway. Yeah, and one thing I I, sh- I want to add is um, I also went to a therapist on some of these topics, not related to FPL, but in general video games. I was feeling very frustrated. Because like I was getting tilted so much, like I, I feel very competitive at times sometimes when I'm playing games, and in FPL I was also feeling similar when I was doing well. Like you get more greedy, like you are like, oh I can do this, I can get in top one k, and then you suddenly get a huge red arrow, and then you feel really really bad. But on the other way, like if if it happened the other way around, like if you were in top. 10k and then suddenly you got into 2k then you feel much better about yourself like oh okay you know i'm progressing um and also regarding you know quitting the game i think in discord there was a discussion about it and someone said i see fpl as a survival game people you know eventually get tilted and then stop playing so i'm here for the long haul <laughs> so maybe that's <laughs> that's an aspect of the game last one standing yeah last one standing. i think, I think how we, win. Yeah. we should also say that fantasy football is is quite a nice safe space for some people who've had gambling addictions and things like that and actually it's quite a nice way to learn about these kind of things within yourself um i know we've got quite serious in terms of mental health talk and maybe this isn't exactly where we were heading but it is something that i've i've learned a lot about decision making in life from fantasy football and i i don't underestimate that that actually it's a safe place to play with risk and that allows you to then learn about how you deal with risk and how you use those decision makings in say in real life but fantasy football is is real life to all of us so. mm-hmm. um but yeah it's a really important 
topic to to bring into this game that possibly isn't covered as much as who's highest on the models for captaincy this week, which I assume we're doing at some point <laughs> coming up soon. Um, I want to ask a kind of related question to James, but yeah, feel free to answer, Johnny or Sigurd, if you're also interested. So, uh, well, kind of James mentioned that it is a misunderstood concept in general, like these like variance and risk in general. So I want to ask, like, do you see any common problems with how people approach ownership getting differential players, you know, how to get the EV, you know, sometimes getting maybe too obsessed about EV. Or, on the other hand, maybe, like, do you see any cool applications of it, like, as, as the positive side? That's a really good question. Um, I see much more, I see much more problems than I, than I see, <laughs> than I see cool uh, applications when people are talking about risk um, in, in public forums. There's a, definitely a lot of cognitive biases going on. So, uh, and just just misconceptions about the kind of the probabilistic properties of risk in in, in fantasy Premier League. So, one thing I think that's talked about a lot that I, maybe isn't quite as legitimate as it first seems is trying to discern between a high upside and high downside. So there is a uh, there's a concept in 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 probability theory called the central limit theorem, and what this basically says is, regardless of the shape of risk that's contained in a single decision, in the long term, it's basically the the right tail and the left tail of your distribution are going to be about the same width. It's in FPL, it's impossible. To craft a to craft a distribution of outcomes that only has a really really long right tail wouldn't that be great if you if we could <laughs> just craft a distribution with no left tail at all and no no downswing no downside outcomes and only upside but it's not possible because of the central limit theorem um, so I, I think we need to start talking less about upside and downside I don't think that they're well defined concepts and I think we need to think more about just risk and risk engagement. Because really, because of the central limit theorem, the only things that we can do to our season level distribution um, is we can, that there are kind of two operations that we can perform. We can move it to the right or left by getting more or more, more EV or less EV, and we can widen it or contract it by engaging with more or less risk. Uh, beyond that, we don't really have a lot of control. Um, in terms of other... Yeah, there's definitely um, a lot of other misconceptions going on. So I think people tend to not necessarily think about risk in a consistent way. Mm -hmm. I think even in the same game week, people will say captain a high-owned player because they want to shield themselves from the downside again and maybe buy a um, buy some kind of differential for mm -hmm. for to to engage in more risk. Most of the time, really, what which we should be trying to do with the distribution in mind is to either increase our risk, decrease our risk, or keep it somewhere in between. It's pretty uncommon that you would want to, in the same game week, increase risk engagement and decrease risk engagement at the same time, both at a cost of EV. It's just, it's just not really, you know, it, it's kind of symptomatic of, I think, some confusion. Um, and I also, I guess... I also want to quickly mention, I, th I think there's, I've seen a lot of people say over the last few years that hits are somehow risky. This is not really related to the rest of the discussion, but actually all that hit is, is it's just mm -hmm. a static minus four points. There, there's <laughs> no risk there at all. Like hits are the single least risky thing that you can do in the game. I guess it's it's true that after you've taken a hit, you're, you've probably got a better team than you had before, and that team is likely to score more points. And in general, the more points you're likely to score, the the more variance your team probably contains. So in that sense, it's true. But taking risks inherently, the action of it is it that doesn't increase risk engagement at all. So I don't know. It's just an interesting an interesting uh, pitfall that I think some people fall into thinking about hits the wrong way. Yeah, zero zero variance in hits. Maybe it could have been fun if it was like a random process. You <laughs> get minus four, minus eight, or minus twelve. That's so a loot, great loot idea. box. Yeah. 
Um, and Johnny, do you then mind giving us a holistic view of risk? Like, how can we combine all this mathematics with the emotional part of risk? Like, do you also find it difficult to, um, like, ca captain a high EV but low on player going against the field? And also, like, I'm asking in the like the long run, like during the hor like during the season, like not only a single game week, maybe, but um, or you know, we also talked about you know how you approach this season, but like, are you going to change how you approach to the game next season, maybe based on your outcome? I I think the the best way we, advice I can give on implementing these sort of ideas is mostly to do with awareness of what you're doing and i think just learning about what it what the effects are of the move that you make so if you're comparing a couple of moves then being aware of the effect of energy of each one and how that might affect you both in terms of actual outcomes but also in terms of emotions so some people might you know if you're a if you're a liverpool fan and you want to support salah and they're both salah and Haaland are both equally owned and that's your deciding factor, as long as you are aware that that was the bias that allowed you to mm. pick Salah over Haaland for no EV cost or 0.5 EV cost or whatever, then you can be happy with that decision because you know what you were doing. Yeah. Whereas if you say, I'm picking Salah because I think he's going to score more points, um, and the reason that you thought he was going to score more points is because you're a Liverpool fan, so you rate him more highly, and actually that's going completely against what, the models are saying or the markets are saying or this that and the other then there's a lack of awareness in what you've actually done there um but yeah, you're more than entitled to captain someone that is low ev and low eo if you know that's what you're doing some people will play super risky and just want to do silly things and as long as they know that's what they're doing then so be it um so i guess it's Looking at each line, I think that the best framework I would say or suggest is to look at each line from an EV point of view first and actually then add in the layer of effective ownership when you're trying to differentiate between these two or three lines rather than, well, I guess at some point we're going to be starting to put it into solvers and things like that and actually having it baked in. But in terms of the tools we have at the moment, then looking at the EV, the top EV lines, comparing them and then going, okay which of these most fits my risk profile, both in terms of absolute risk I'm willing to take, in terms of gambling on minutes of a certain player. Maybe um, one of my friends went quite early on Darwin Nunez earlier in the season because he was quite confident in his minutes before other people were more confident. But he said, I'm a Liverpool fan. I think I know a little bit more on this and I'm willing to bet my knowledge that his minutes will be there. So that was a risk he took. And he might have been wrong on that, but he said, I know, I'm, you know, I know the risk I'm taking here. And it, well, it paid off in minutes. It didn't pay off in points, but that's uh, I'll start with Nunez for you. Um, <laughs> so I, th I think and then things you can do if you're trying to look for more risk for either free or low cost in terms of transfers is maybe looking at the top line and then looking at the top line with a highly owned player band perhaps so the mm -hmm. the way that you might find that wildcard 35 line without Haaland is just see what ev the top line is throwing up and then see what the top ev line without Haaland is and actually if it's really close you can start to look into it a bit more and see whether it's robust enough and actually it looks like it depends on joao pedro's minutes um but if i'm happy enough in that then maybe i will go for it maybe it depends on where i'm ranked um but that's how i can go oh i I might want some more risk. Where might I get it? It's actually just going, how close do the lines without a highly owned player look? Um, I think the things that I might look into next season are perhaps a sort of evolution of risk across the season. And actually, I think I slightly undervalued going with the field early in the season for team value purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my... One of the things, but then I was also slightly aware of that. I wasn't making early transfers because I decided that I wanted to reduce my cognitive load through the week and just not worry mm -hmm. about them early season. So for a small team value loss, I was happy to go. I'll pay that team value loss to not be thinking about FPL all week because I've got other stuff on. Or not having to be checking the price changing sites. Whereas if you go, oh, I'm happy to do that or I'm doing that anyway, then maybe looking for those 
possible risks of going early in the season. James um, highlighted a really nice framework earlier about how to evaluate price changes and team value. So maybe you can bake that in and go, okay, well, actually, this player is very slightly below in the projections, but he's well owned and lots of people are buying him. So that's that's a bandwagon I might want to get on. But again, it's the awareness, you know, getting on him because he's quite good and his price might rise rather than, um, ah, he's in form and he's great and he's going to score loads of points. So I'm going to get on him and everyone's going to get on him and he's going to take off and we're going to leave everyone else behind. And actually, sometimes it happens, but that's not what you can expect to happen. So I think we're still figuring things out. I think we're still sort of slightly finding our footing with this, which is why there's no uh, well, there's no button for for risk yet. Whereas there is, we're not too far off a button for give me a top or good set of moves over the next few season, a few weeks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that's kind of where my thoughts are and where we're going to go. But um, I'm excited to hear other people's opinions on this and um, see where we go with it. Yeah, perfect. And um, thank you. And in the fourth and the final part of our discussion, let's talk about, um, you know, what kind of tools there are for managing the risk. Um, I strongly believe that we already have very cool tools to optimize for average case or, you know, what we call as expected value or projected points. I think the next big thing in FPL analytics will be optimizing with risk and variance involved. Um, there are not too many tools available at the moment, but I think, and I can promise you that we, we are working on it and there will be more tools. FPL challenge was a great motivation for it. And I'm hoping that we will have, you know, better ways to measure it maybe sometime next season. Um, Meanwhile, I think simulated scenarios in FPL Optimize is an interesting tool you can play around. It is only for a single game week, though. Um, but you can also do things like, you know, getting the betting odds from Rob, Rob T FPL on Twitter, or you know, use a team strength model like Elevenify's um, model, and you can maybe simulate outcomes, use um, uh, like goal shares to figure out, you know, oh, what's the chance of Alan getting three goals or a hat trick or Fulton getting a hat trick again. Um, and then banning or forcing players based on their ownership and getting different lines and then in- investigating how much EV you are losing by going with a less owned player. It's also interesting. You know, maybe you are not losing much EV for an increase in risk or maybe decreasing the risk. Well, as one of the most innovative people in FPL community, I want to ask you, James, again, what kind of tools will bring the cutting edge in FPL regarding variance and risk in future, you think? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's um, definitely one of the things that I spend more of my time thinking about than anything else. <laughs> so like I, I have, a, I think, a clear picture in my head of where I want to end up, which I is like in terms of tying in risk engagement with strategy in this season long game. Um, I, what I really want is a model, preferably uh, a kind of a single optimization problem um, rather than some long convoluted process that involves building a, a frontier of teams and then picking one of them. What I really want is one model where you can feed in some kind of functional objective, mm-hmm. say to maximize probability of top 10K, um, or uh, you could feed in that function and it can spit out, I guess, a decision that you can make at your current moment um, to maximize this value function. And I think like we're pretty close. We're not quite there in FPL Challenge. Um, first of all, because there's all this auto-sub stuff. Fingers crossed that'll be gone for next season. Um, but also because we're, we've still got this fairly long convoluted process of constructing a frontier and then picking a team. What, what I really want to do in FPL Challenge is to solve in a single optimization problem the team that has the highest probability of winning the game. And I think it's actually possible to do. Um, I've tried to do a lot of a lot of maths around it, but there's a lot of calculus involved and I'm, I'm just not very good at it. Um, so that, that's probably, I guess, the next the next step is is getting to that point in FPL challenge where we have one problem that we can solve um, to get 
the team that we want to get. And then, yeah, the, the, the future is in the season long game in trying to integrate all of these ideas that we've able to be able to do in the short term um, into the, into the longer term. And what might that look like? I, th- I think probably one way or another, it's going to involve um, a type of optimization called stochastic optimization. Mm-hmm. This is this is my favorite type of optimization, and it's um, an optimization problem where you're able to, I guess, solve across different decision points in the future where you have some kind of unrealized information that you don't have yet. And in in terms of like fixtures and robustness, we've already been able to implement stochastic optimization for FPL, and maybe the next frontier is implementing stochastic optimization for risk. I think it's an idea with yeah. with potential, but it's still for us. It's still a long way off. Probably a number of years. Who knows? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I I had a feeling that you were gonna say stochastic optimization. I also have. An I, I actually. Sorry. I mean, I actually like. I, I don't think I have any conversations anymore where I don't mention stochastic optimization. <laughs> that's true. That's <laughs> somehow it always sentence. comes up. Yeah. yeah <laughs> usually. Yeah. I'm surprised it took us this long. From the start to now is the longest. I've yeah. <laughs> longest. Yeah. Um, Undoubtedly. <laughs> and Sigurd, I have a question uh, regarding this, like managing the risk. Suppose, like, I'm a new player in FPL, and I'm I asked you, you know, I heard about risk and you know ownership and all this stuff. Like, how do I do it? Like, if I'm playing for the first time, I build a team, you know, that is pretty good in EV. Like, what would you recommend for me to manage the risk? Because, like, obviously, like we are missing some critical tools to measure it accurately right now. But what would be a practical tip you would give to a new player? Well, it depends what your goal is, first of all. What are you aiming for? Um, and it also, and I guess it's hard to hard to know how you react to, you know, unfortunate outcomes without trying it. But, but um I don't think it's an awful strategy to sort of stay with the field at the beginning of the season mm-hmm. a little bit. Yeah. I, I also think that the I also think that the EV might be a little less accurate at the beginning of the season uh, because there are new players from different leagues. I mean, there, there's more sort of unknowns. So, mm-hmm. so for instance, captaining Holland sometimes when he has zero point one less EV, but you know he's going to be, you know extremely high known i don't think that is a terrible strategy at the beginning especially for someone new that might be discouraged if you sort of have like three or four bad gimmicks and may quit the game so i think maybe that is <laughs> is, is the way i would recommend for the beginner um but yeah but of course if, if you have if you come from a if you're a poker player and are extremely addicted to highs and lows and you know and, and want to gamble then go for it you know just uh Grab whatever EV and risk you can, I guess. <laughs> well, all Sigurds, I seems like they they enjoy grabbing EV. Um, so okay, I I have two more questions from the audience. We're almost running out of time, so I will ask them. I will try to get a fast answer from you. Um, so this question came from our Discord server. It says, "Captaincy is a good way to increase risk on a game week to game week by game week <coughs> basis." But what about longer term risk and how to take risk around injuries and the general fog of war? I, I have a feeling James will again talk about stochastic optimization, but yeah, let me hear. Yeah, it's almost worth asking someone else this because that's exactly what I'm envisioning when I'm thinking about <laughs> stochastic optimization in terms of risk management. Yeah. Um like we already tried to plan robustly, but Johnny used a really good phrase earlier. Um that our robust the way that we plan robustly at the moment is very much risk and not at risk agnostic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's totally true that being able to understand and quantify the risk of injuries better, um, and the way to do that is by modeling it as a stochastic problem. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it it it's it, it's definitely the way to go about this. It's a really, really interesting idea, and I hope to do more work on it in the years to come. Mm-hmm. I think one of the the quite straightforward proxies that maybe isn't quite a solidly defined or well backed up statement is to sort of look at say there's I think this is something that calm strategy um mentioned at calm underscore strategy rather than 
the general car- well, I mean, he, he advocates for a calm strategy. Another former MD champion um, was talking about he like he plays with a lot of risk. Um, and one of the things he did on his wild card in game week seventeen, I think, was um, Levi Colwell was quite a popular pick. Um, and actually, it looked quite likely that Malo Gusto was going to hold down a spot and was a little bit cheaper. And actually, a large portion of defenders' EV is the clean sheets. Obviously, there's the bonus as well, and there's some that have quite high attacking threat. But the difference between Colwell and Gusto wasn't too much. So swapping out a player for the lesser-owned version of the same player um, is sometimes a quite... An, a, I guess it's a simple and cheap way, which is why it's not super effective. But you can do quite quick things like that. Maybe everyone's on Madison and you're happy to go for Richarlison and actually, you know, that their EV is going to be correlated because they're on the same team. Um, But then there's different positional shifts. So I think as a really quick, it's not a very robust version of it, but that is a thing that you can try to do sometimes is just go, is there an alternative who's going to be really similar and plays for the same team is often an easy way to do that um, because the points are going to be correlated quite similarly but if Gusto scores and Colwell just keeps the clean sheet then you've got some some bonus and if Colwell scores then that was that was your downside but I, yeah the, an- the answer is stochastic optimization I'm afraid boils down to that um, and Second question says, when measuring risk, is EV part of the equation or is it only ownership that matters? So is it true that like high EV players have more risk or not? Yeah, I guess this is an interesting an interesting question. On a surface level, the answer is definitely yes. Um, higher EV players have higher kind of, I guess, rates of production. And the higher a rate of production is, in general, in statistics, um, especially if it's distributed in a certain way that most events in football are, um, the, the higher the rate is, the higher the variance is too. But in practice, I'm not sure if that should change how we're thinking about it, because as much as it will widen our distribution, picking high EV players, it will also um, it will also widen our... Um, it will also move it to the right and basically probably by the same amount or more. So I don't know. I, I would never go against a high EV player um, because their EV is so high that it might be a risk. I prefer to think about risk in relative terms rather than in these absolute terms. I have a follow-up question on this for the FPL challenge since you were kind of calculating the uh, the variance of players. Is it higher on defense players or is it higher for midfielders or forwards? That's a really good question. Um, in general, the teams that have the highest variance um, are teams with lots of defenders in from the same team. Mm-hmm. But in terms of individual assets, mm-hmm. the highest variance are midfielders, okay. even even slightly higher than forwards. Because these defenders, defenders are more correlated with each other. And as I mentioned earlier, correlated players, the more correlation you have, this adds to the um, this adds to the overall amount of risk, and defenders are much, much, much more correlated than midfields and forwards. So, if you want to have a really high risk team, um, going with lots of defenders on the same team is the way to do it. But if you just want to pick one high risk asset, then probably you want to go with a high EV, low owned midfielder or forward. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I think one one final thing to to push home this point of stacking on. <laughs> the same defense is that actually yeah, gonna... there are there are other daily fantasy games that i play where the only thing that they specifically do differently in the game is punish stacking defenders so it must be good enough if they're having to do that because it's overpowered so fpl didn't do that so we should take advantage of it yeah, it's it's an obvious strategy really to yeah. to stack them yeah i remember i think it was jan who had like triple defenders from the same team. Maybe it was Chelsea. Can't remember. 
but and then some of us commenting on his team saying that you know what kind of a stupid team is this like triple defenders it's kind of like seen as triple a Newcastle game. wasn't it something like yeah, that triple, yeah. Yeah. it's, it's worth thinking about in the main game as well it's like actually if you want to widen your distribution is um if you've got a choice between a midfielder and a defender from two teams and actually you could go double defense and double midfield you're you know you're stacking on a defense double <laughs> arsenal defense has come in quite well for a lot of people and actually so it's you, really the only defense worth worth having at the moment it seems like yeah, so although i've got double arsenal midfield like a, <laughs> an idiot and before i close the episode is there anything you want to discuss or ask each other or comment Not really, but it was great to be a guest there, and I've tried my best to follow Trout's uh, explanations. And um, mm-hmm. no, but I think it's uh, super interesting, and I look forward to seeing the next types of of tools um, in FPL and to use them. Um, so, so looking forward to that. And and I just want to say that um, for me, like I'm the analytical part of FPL. The, one of the main reasons why I tried to get on that early was because I saw how solvers sort of changed and solved poker. Mm-hmm. And I saw how powerful it is in order, like, if you want to be a top player in poker now, you have to study uh, using a solver in some way. So I just knew how powerful it was. So that motivated me to, to sort of learn these things for myself in FPL. And that's been that's paid off, I think, for me anyway. Yeah. Especially this season, I I, I will say, uh, all the analytics players are doing pretty well. Most, yeah. yeah, it's been amazing this season. I just want to highlight how how insane it is that I think. I mean, I've like kind of gone through the the top one hundred players, just kind of out of interest in the last few weeks, and I reckon maybe as much as ten percent of them are using solvers and that is that's just a mind-boggling fact like that i mean it, this is an unusual season that's definitely not going to happen next year almost certainly not um who knows if it's going to happen a, again a, a season as good as this but wow i mean i don't think you can deny that at least on some level it, it really works and johnny anything you want to add or um I, I, just, I was just wondering what you guys were thinking in terms of dialing risk up or down for the the run into the the end, or what you guys. I guess a couple of you are in positions that you've not really not really been able to finish in before, so dialing the risk down might be the way that you're going. But I don't know what Sigurd. Do you yeah, know? I've already spoken about it a lot. What do you What are you doing, yeah. Sigurd? I'm not really looking at risk that much, honestly. Well, the way I play is I I I run the solver for. And see what the different sort of top lines are, and then I try to, and then try to use my own experience and sort of look at other sources of information and, and pick the one I like the most. That's that's usually how how I like to go. And I focus a lot on trying to find the decision that I guess feel is a, is a not word we should use, but but feels good to me, and and f- f- not from sort of a grass point of view, but. Um, just something I'm happy with, and that has very high EV close to top, and then just go for it. Uh, I don't particularly seek risk or risk or less risk at at, at this point. I think. And I guess that's a wrap on today's uh, dive into the depths of the risk in FPL. A huge thank you to James, uh, Johnny and Sigurd for joining me, uh, joining our podcast and sharing your expertise. Um, Today we have untangled the often nutty concept of probability, expected value and variance risk and seen how these statistical tools are, aren't just for, you know, analytics FC, but they are for every FPL manager out there. Um, we have explored how risk plays out in the decisions we make each game week and like from the players we select to the captains we trust, our guests have drawn parallels between uh, the strategic gambles in poker and the calculated risks in FPL and the everyday decisions we all face that require a balance between potential rewards and risks we are willing to take. I especially enjoyed James's description of like uh, like tails because of the central limit theorem. 
that's true that you cannot really have a you know large right tail without having a left tail and as we have heard embracing the uncertainty can be as thrilling as it is nerve-wracking like tilting is part of the game and but with the right mindset and like being aware you know what kind of risk we are taking and using data and the tools we have discussed today i think it can also be incredibly rewarding and remember whether you are playing it safe or chasing the big points with bold moves the key is to make informed choices and who knows perhaps by the time this time next season we will have even more sophisticated ways to to play the game or help us decide when, decide when to stick to this or fold in the great poker game of FPL. So keep an eye keep an eye on the skies and your stats and may your FPL decisions be as informed as they are inspired. Be sure to engage with us on social media with your thoughts on today's episode and also share your own stories of risk and reward. Until next time, this is Sertab signing off from the FPL Optimized Podcast. May your arrows be green and your risks well calculated. Until next time, stay curious and stay analytical. Goodbye.